this evening. I believe that there's still a few more folk that will sign to be involved in church planting. And uh, we want to just uh, thank this church for hosting our event this evening, uh, and our event this whole weekend, and uh, Pastor for your support. And uh, Brittany, I believe you're planning to sing. Let's have you sing at the very end. As we're filling out the, the cards, if there's any further responses that they would like to give that way. Let's bow our heads for now a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just pray as we close out our time together this weekend of Seats Conference that you will empower each person here to know what their next step is in terms of church planting and reaching the harvest for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, a few of you were at camp meeting. Uh, when I spoke on this uh, subject of rescue mission, but it has been uh, updated and, and uh, there's some new uh, slides in it and some new content in it, so even for those that may have heard before, there will be some new information. Um, I want to begin by, with a quiz. Uh, I like to, once I became a teacher at the seminary, you always have to have quizzes. And uh, a good multiple choice quiz has two legitimately good answers, right? And then two that are clearly not right. Um, that's, that's the way you write these. So anyway, let's see how we do on the quiz. Baby Jessica was re rescued from a lion enclosure at the zoo, a well, the top of a tree, or a flooding river. Those are the options. All right. What was the first thing the Apostle John noticed about heaven? Was it the angelic choir, the streets of gold, the tree of life, and then there was no more sea? Next one, what did Pastor Tom, that's me, what did I find for $4.99? Was it a big watermelon, a kitten, an all-you-can-eat buffet, or a haircut? And then, what is the solution to the rescue mission of humanity? Is it more workers, unchurched people becoming interested, persecution, or the latter rain? So let's go begin. Uh, rescue missions inspire us. We get excited when we hear about them. October 13, 2010. 33 Chilean miners were rescued after being trapped 69 days in a collapsed mine. How many of you followed that on the news when it happened? Boy, all, the whole world was riveted on what was taking place. Every life was saved. The journey to freedom took 15 minutes per person. A capsule, single person capsule, traveling through 2,050 feet of solid rock. Amazing. Thought to be dead for many days, for a couple weeks. Thought to be no survivors, and yet a rescue mission against all odds. Another rescue mission, perhaps the most famous in, in American history, where we have a phrase, Houston, we've had a problem. A uh, very famous phrase coming from the, the Apollo 13 mission on April 11, 1970. On the second day of the mission, 200,000 miles above the earth, the mission to the moon became a rescue mission against all odds. And of course, all available resources in Houston. We're trying to resolve how to bring this uh, damaged spacecraft, this, this ruined spacecraft back to Earth. They utilized every resource and every life was saved. Amazing rescue. Baby Jessica, 1987. 18 months old, toddling along, falls into an abandoned well. Whoa, what a, what a dramatic experience for parents. What's the problem of just uh, you know, trying to get her quickly? What if the well caves in and covers it, right? So they probably had to dig down right beside the well, a parallel well, all the way down, but far enough away that the, the walls wouldn't, wouldn't cave in. It took rescuers two days to free her from just simply being trapped 22 feet below ground. Here's baby Jessica at her high school graduation. I'm sure she's glad that somebody was on a rescue mission for her life. Final one here. January 15, 2009, the miracle in the Hudson, U.S. Airway Flight 1549 hit a flock of geese mm -hmm. shortly after takeoff. Mm -hmm. Captain solely navigated emergency landing into the Hudson River. All 155 passengers survived with only minor injuries. Captain solely became an instant celebrity and uh, began more speaking than he did <laughs> flying after that because everybody wanted to hear his story. I want to talk about what won't happen in heaven. Most of the activities, in fact, uh, the great majority of activities that we do as a church, we will also do in heaven. Let's think about some of them for a moment. 
In, in church, the music's good, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. We enjoy listening to music. There's a beautiful piano here, and I think there was a heard an organ today as well. And we hear voices that are raised to, to praise the Lord. Uh, your conference president has a, a beautiful voice, um, you know, and, and Brittany, and, and it's just... But, you know, I've, uh, I've talked to musicians, and, and musicians know that uh, there's always a note that could have been hit just a little bit better. There's always just that, that run on the piano that you could have just, right? Could have just gotten a little bit more correct. Now, those of us that aren't, you know, really accomplished musicians, we don't notice those things, right? Yeah. But every musician knows that it could go just a little bit better. And every once in a while, I hear an instrument played that I've never even heard before. Now, I've always thought that I want to play the saxophone. And uh, I just love when somebody can really play saxophone well. It just, it's about my favorite instrument to accompany a, a song service. Just beautiful. But I swore never to do it because when I was in, in, at Walla Walla University, the student body president was a saxophone player. And something was wrong with the reed on his, mic on his saxophone. And he squeaked every other note all the way through the solo. And when he finished, the entire congregation erupted in laughter. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I will never try to play a saxophone. It's just a little too difficult for me. In heaven, the music is going to be perfect. If I want to play a saxophone in heaven, no problem. I can pick it up without any lessons. I think so. But maybe, maybe we'll be able to learn it, but we'll learn it perfectly, right? No errors along the way. New voices, new instruments, unheard of sounds, eye has not seen or ear heard. We don't even have an idea of the things that God has prepared for those that are saved. We don't know. It'll be amazing experiences, the sensory experiences that we will have. In church, the fellowship is good, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if it's a healthy church, if it's a vibrant church. We enjoy getting together. We enjoy seeing each other. Um, you know, my church are the people I work with as presenters on our team, and I, I just love being able to get together when we have our seats conferences. And the fellowship is fantastic. We had to drive to Toronto. It was easier for us to drive there than to fly. And the five of us in that van, we had a riot. We had such a good time. They, they pulled these five pastors over and made us go into special security checkpoint. <laughs> they were a little suspicious that all five of us were pastors. We looked like uh, hockey players or something. I don't know. We were all casual and just having a good time. But wow, what a good time. The fellowship is good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Fellowshipping with our brothers and sisters. But here on this earth, the fellowship can be broken. It can be broken simply because somebody takes a move across the country, right? You have, do you have a, a daughter that has moved somewhere else? Or she, will it, be. she will be. And how do you feel about that? It's, it's, it's not good. It's not good. It's a little, it's a little challenging, isn't it? Yeah. Mom's getting a little concerned about this, right? Wow, when distance separates us, it's difficult, isn't it? Mm -hmm. From those that we love, even if it's for a good reason, for a job or opportunities that people move. Uh, that separation breaks the fellowship. But the ultimate loss is when we lose someone to death. Uh, this is at the graveside of Opal Epperly. She's a lady who really adopted me as her grandson. I didn't uh, expect that. I didn't know that she would take such an interest in me. I was not her flesh and blood. But her and her husband, uh, he was 80 and she was 65 at the time when they moved to Walla Walla at the College Place, Washington. And immediately, because of a mutual friend that he had, who's a violin maker, a fiddle maker, and I, we have a relative that's also a fiddle maker, and he said, talked to my dad and said, you know, you're really good, you should go meet my buddy, Charlie Epperly. So we showed up there, and from the instant we showed up at their house, it was love at first sight for all of us. And we just formed a bond that was so deep. I would uh, go over to her home, and uh, we would play in the, they had a creek in their, in their uh, yard, and we would... We would walk down the creek and we catch the crawdads, the crawfish, crayfish, and we would just play with them. And, and we'd pick blackberries and just eat them as we were walking along their creek bed. And she would play with us around her house, just run circles around, uh, you know, just chasing us. And she'd sit down and read to us. And my favorite thing to do, though, was to uh, sneak into their house, because the door was always unlocked, to sneak in and hide underneath the kitchen table without her noticing while she was cooking, washing dishes. And I would just wait. And as soon as her ankles would get close enough to that table, I would jump out and grab them. <laughs> and, she, ah! Ah! and she would, and, and, and I would take off running, and she would, 65 years old, would come running after me. And she would be chasing me around, chasing me around, just laughing. 
talking and having a great time. <laughs> Fortunately, the Lord spared her life. I wasn't the cause of her losing her life from one of those spirit, spirit attacks. But when she died, oh, my heart was broken. My heart was broken. This lady who gave so much to me, who didn't have to do that, who had no obligation by being flesh and blood to do that, but just love me. Wow, the loss of fellowship. But in heaven, the fellowship will be perfect. The Apostle John, the first thing he saw in heaven, he says, Now there was a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. What an odd thing to notice about heaven, that there was no more ocean, there was no more sea. Why was that important to John? You see where John was located over there in Patmos? What's between him and Ephesus and Laodicea, Philadelphia, Thyatira? What's between him and those places? It's the ocean. He was separated by the sea, the sea of separation. And when he saw heaven, the first thing he noticed is there was no more separation. There was no more sea. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> In church, the food is good. Now, I, am the, I, I have the title, the official potluck analyst of the Texas conference. It was amazing. The conference actually paid me to, to have that kind of a job description. <laughs> it was actually self-titled uh, that way. <laughs> But uh, I, I had a top five list of the best potlucks in Texas, and, uh, and they were the ones to avoid. And I would say the potluck today rated very well. Excellent. Well done. Well done, church. Well done. And I think if I wasn't a vegan, it would have been even higher rated in my mind. But there was plenty of vegan options for me, which is usually not the case. So that was very well done. Enjoyed it. Uh, this church here, really, they do a great job with, with their food, and uh, particularly at multicultural churches, the food is excellent. I mean, what a blessing if you inherit these Filipinos, yeah. and they join your church. Everybody's going to want to come to your church, right? Yeah. At least for the potluck. Yeah. Tremendous food. But my wife is Brazilian, and uh, she taught me something very important about cooking and about food. And uh, this is very important, Roger. I don't know if your family knows this yet, but everything with onions and garlic is better. <laughs> you know, and, and we bought the 50 pound bag of onions and we'll, we'll get through those before they go bad. It's no problem. Uh, you know, the, the, we would buy the boxes of garlic from Mexico and <laughs> just buy the whole box. Uh, but we just love it. And then limes and cilantro. Oh, you have those things that just enhances everything. So anyway, um, I, I'll tell you, I, I like the food in church and I like multicultural churches. And uh, it's a great experience that way. But sometimes... The food does stay with you all day long. And so even where the food is good, it uh, is not always perfection, right? We all have different re reactions and responses to the food we eat. But in, in, in heaven, we can't even imagine the kind of food that will be there. It says in the middle of the street, and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life which bore 12 fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. And so for some of you that have, have heard me share this before, you know what the first fruit has to be on the tree of life, right? What is it? Mangoes. Every church says mangoes. And mangoes. Everybody says mangoes. That's it. It's got to be mangoes. Yeah, and, and, uh, and yet we need, we're going to go three months here. We'll look at the second month in the tree of life. Uh, we can put in requests for this kind of thing. I don't know. Um, but uh, I have to be loyal to my new Michigan roots and let you know that a Michigan nectarine is pretty good. That's, uh, that is delicious. So, uh, yeah, that's a tremendous. If you've not had that before, that is definitely worth it. You know, we live in the fruit belt there around Edge University. That is one of the benefits. If you're trying to look for positive things during the winter, you remember the fruit during the summer. But uh, we get those Concord grapes going at the end of the growing season. Oh, it's just, just amazing. Make our own grape juice. Wow, it's good. But uh, let's, let's go to the third month here. And, and this is one that uh, shares some of my cultural experiences. And uh, you, don't, you may not recognize that, but that's Aki. That's uh, the national fruit of Jamaica. Yeah. And it, it, Yaha, no problem, man. It's Irish. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it, this is like scrambled eggs for a vegan. I mean, this is just delicious. You put that with a little veggie food. Now, I know veggie meat, but, you know, it's, it, the traditional dish has it with salt fish. Mm. Now, I was just in Toronto, and I was sharing how much I enjoy uh, ackee and uh, veggie food, because I'm a vegan now. And uh, dear sister brought me some ackee and salt fish. <laughs> I've been a vegan for three years, 
That's what I'm going to eat it. <laughs> so I had my Jesus ate fish after he was tra- uh, after, <laughs> after he was resurrected, right? But anyway, uh, we won't we won't go there. But it was delicious. <laughs> but I'm back to my vegan ways once again. What is missing from the plethora of heaven's delight? We talked about the uh, the food. We talked about the music. We talked about the fellowship, right? But what's missing? What's missing? Jesus Christ. Roger. There'll be no more handbills in heaven. I hope I hope even Roger can say an amen to that. <laughs> no more of those beast handbills in heaven, right? Wow. No more prayers for the lost. Prayers, a very spiritual thing. But no more prayers for the lost in heaven. No evangelistic meetings. As much as we enjoy those, no more evangelistic meetings. No baptisms in heaven. We won't need a baptistry there, will we? No baptisms in heaven. There'll be no more rescue mission. Why? Why? Eternal decisions have already been made while here on planet Earth. So, the mission of the church is to reach lost people. That is why we exist. The fellowship's nice. The food is good. The music can be great. But the reason we exist, the reason we are here, is to reach lost people. It's for a rescue mission. Amen. That mission began the moment that Adam and Eve fell. The moment they sinned, that rescue mission began. You see, God was accustomed to going on a walk with Adam and Eve in the evening. They were in the Garden of Eden. And he went out for his evening walk, and Adam and Eve were not there. So God personally went walking through the garden and said, Adam and Eve, where are you? Those words, where are you, this God who is seeking lost humanity, echo through the corridors of Scripture all the way to where we live today. Mm -hmm. We serve a God who is seeking lost people. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful for seeking God. Because I'm going to ask you a question right now. How many of you have a parent, child, or a sibling who does not walk with Jesus? Just raise your hand. That's almost everybody here. I am thankful that God is still seeking them. Even when they are not seeking Him, He is still seeking them. When I was attending the seminary, when I was where, you know, Adam and uh, Jared, Reed just finished, when I was at that point in my life in ministry, Mm -hmm. Went through a very difficult time where my parents uh, began having some serious marital troubles that ended up in a divorce. And uh, some people say that the the effect on adult children is also very, very dramatic and significant. And uh, you you want your parents to be together, it doesn't matter what age you are. It, it, it It really just throws your life into some kind of a disjointed, you don't have that anchor of being able to go home. and It just isn't right. It's not, not the way things are meant to be. Very painful experience. And trying to have me help try to save it. And, and, and you know, I'm a pastor trying to help them with their marriage. And it just everything was falling apart. And both of my parents went a direction in their life that was an embarrassment to me in terms of the decisions that they made. Decisions I never dreamed my parents would make. Decisions I never saw my parents making as I was growing up and uh, experiencing a nuclear family growing up to the point where I told my wife I don't see any hope I don't see how either of my parents will ever come back to God my dad remarried he's been through another divorce now has a girlfriend living with him my mom was making decisions that I mean, to me, were even more horrific than that. And I I just couldn't understand it. And I was embarrassed. Uh, It was uncomfortable for me to be around her. I wanted to live as far away from where she lived as possible, just so I didn't have to deal with that pain and embarrassment. And I told my wife, I really don't see that there's much hope for my mom. I gave up, I have to admit to you, I gave up even praying for my mom. It seemed a hopeless case. 
I gave up, but God didn't give up. We serve a God who continues to seek people. Amen. A year ago, in November, I rebaptized my mom. She is on fire for Jesus. I'm proud of my mom. I'm proud of what decision she's making in her life. She's going to be flying out for my daughter's graduation here in just a, a few weeks. We'll be staying with us for a little while. Amen. Oh, she loves Jesus. She's in the, in the Word. She's reading Desire of Ages. She's just, she's just soaking up all these things. And she said, I can't believe where I let my life go. But she's back. Praise God. Because we serve a God who keeps seeking lost people. Amen. Don't give up on that mom, that brother, sister, that daughter, that son. Because God keeps seeking. But you know what? God calls us, well, if we look here, Luke summarized Jesus' mission in one verse. Luke was a, the only, as, as Adam pointed out, the only Gentile scripture author. And he didn't even, he wasn't one of the disciples, but what he did is he researched everything he could find about Jesus and he put it together in an orderly account, right? And what he discovered as he studied everything he could about Jesus, is that Jesus' mission to the planet Earth was this. For the Son of Man has come. This is an all-inclusive statement. He's putting it all together. He's giving the, the big picture. This is what it's all about. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Amen. That was Jesus' mission to planet Earth. And yet Jesus says, as you sent me into the world, speaking to the Father, to God, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Who's Jesus talking about? His followers, his disciples, he's talking about us. Just as you sent me to seek and save the lost, I'm sending my disciples, I'm sending my followers out into the world to seek and to save that which is lost. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. We had a very interesting experience, and I, I'm just going to give you a little a, a background because um, I appreciate Roger said that every mission statement of any Seventh-day Adventist church has to be that we have the Great Commission. But we Seventh-day Adventists also have a unique mission, which is the Three Angels' message, which says we have a further message for those that know Christ, but need a further understanding, right? So that's part of our mission as well. And I had a very interesting experience. We raised golden retrievers, and the lady in the pink right here, her name's Andrea. She's 29 years old. She raised, raises golden retrievers in Romania. And we purchased a couple dogs from her, Roger. And so we developed a friendship over the years, and... She was coming to the United States. She said, can I come and spend a week with you guys? So we said, sure, come and stay with us. And, uh, and she said, can my father come and stay too? Would that be okay? Do you have enough room uh, for my father to stay too? We said, absolutely. So they came and found out they're very on fire for Jesus. The Baptists, they're very on fire for Jesus. Okay. And uh, what we learned is that Radu is a professional cartoonist. He's won awards for cartoons. And he loves doing spiritual cartoons. And, uh, and so I began thinking, I wonder, this is why I'm giving this a little bit of background, I wonder if he could do some cartoon, uh, cartoon work for me. Well, I happen to know of an artist that's a Seventh-day Adventist that's very famous. Do you know who he is? Nathan Green, right? If you don't know Nathan Green, you need to look him up tonight. Amazing artist. So I got a private tour of Nathan Green's studio for Radu, the artist. What am I doing? I'm connecting in his area of interest, right? I'm having to meet another Seventh-day Adventist who's a passionate Christian. Oh, Radu was so excited. He couldn't believe it. He was pulling out all his cartoons, and Nathan Green was commenting on them. And that one's, that, one, that one's publishable. You could get that. I mean, it was just, it was exciting to see that. But then I began to think about connections. Andrea's a vet. So you know, we go to the, we have the vet office. We have a relationship with them. I know they like to be involved in missions. They're they're Christians. How about if I get uh, Andrea a tour of our vet office so she can meet folk? And when I did that, I did not realize that our vet does mission trips to Romania all the time. He loves Romania. In fact, our, the owner of our vet clinic, his son, uh, well, he, he sponsored this young lady to come from Romania and she was living in their home. 
And he thought this was all good. His youngest son was the only one that wasn't married. And he was six years younger than Ramona, who was from Romania. But his youngest son comes to him after Ramona's been there for a while. He said, Dad, I think God's telling me to marry Ramona. Dad hadn't seen any of this. He didn't see it coming at all. He said, well, we got a problem here. Ramona's living here. Have you talked with Ramona about this? Well, no. Well, maybe you should go talk with Ramona and see if she agrees. <laughs> and so he visits with Ramona, and the next day they come back and say, you know, we think God might be in this. We think maybe we should go ahead and get married. He said, okay, we've got a real problem. You're under the same roof here. He says, you need a promise you're going to be pure before God. You're going to have five months of counseling, of marital counseling. If you do both those things, I'll pay for your wedding. Not only did he pay for the wedding, he also officiated the wedding. So here now I'm beginning to see all these connections I didn't know before. Here, uh, here's a vet from Romania. Here's a, 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 another vet that we go to that we know that has a Romanian daughter-in-law. So what did we do? We said, let's have a meal in our home. So here's, here's Andrea from Romania, her dad. Here's the vet's daughter-in-law from Romania and his son, Tom. So Tom and Ramona. When we had our meal together, Tom and Ramona uh, left, and, and they brought a gift, very sweet, very nice. She made some bread, and it was just, just a sweet couple. As they were driving home, we got a phone call. Said, hey, can you come to our dad's house for supper tomorrow night? So we go to his house the, the next night. And, uh, and he, uh, while he's there, he says, uh, Tom, you know, come over and do some skeet shooting with me. Well, I've never shot at skeet anything before. But uh, I'm going to go shoot some skeet because I want to build a relationship with him. He says, your family, come join us for 4th of July. We want you to come be part of our family. So God is opening all these doors. And it's just wonderful to see where the Holy Spirit is leading in these connections that we can begin to make as we're about God's business. But I, I share this background because I want to share with you the cartoons that he drew for me. This is the new part that I want to show you. I love the story in John 4 about the Samaritan woman at the well. And I take a little bit of a, a different angle on it because what did the disciples do when they arrived at this well in Samaria? What was their agenda? They were hungry. They wanted some good food, right? So this is what Radu drew for me. Take a look at this. All right? What do you see happening there? <laughs> These disciples, boy, they're having a good meal, aren't they? Yeah. And here's the Samaritans around them, all these needs, and they're not even paying one attention, one, one bit of attention to it, right? A whole village that's ready to accept Jesus, and all they're thinking about is filling their stomach with some good food, right? How often, friends, do we do that? We're about our agenda, about our schedule, what we want to do, and are we have blinders on to the needs of the people that are around us. So disciples go back. I want them to draw this. Look at they, they they got filled up really well. They're pretty happy. They got their tummies full, but really don't have an interest in what's going on here in the needs of this Samaritan woman. Jesus had to say to them, I, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for their white harvest. What was Jesus talking about? Was he talking about the wheat? No, the people. Now look at this. Their eyes are they're, they're not paying any attention at all, right? Look at this right here. Jesus is talking about the Samaritan village right up here, right? This village was ripe for harvest, but his disciples didn't notice. Did a great job, didn't he? His cartoons. That's, that's amazing. He's, he's gifted. Laser surgery is needed for our eyes if we're to see the harvest as Jesus sees it. We need to have laser surgery. I look at how often my eyes have been closed to opportunities that Jesus has place right in front of me. I was visiting a church plant in Cedar Park, Texas, driving Highway 1431 back to Highway 35 to come home, and a lot of new construction happening in that area, and I noticed a placard sign out by the street, out by the highway, that said, Haircuts 499. Now, for me, that's a really good deal. Jared, I don't know if that's such a good deal for you, brother. No. <laughs> but uh, that's a good deal for me, 499 haircut. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I pulled in, and I was willing to wait a little bit to, to get, get my hair cut. As soon as I sat down, this lady began to pour her life story out to me. I really wasn't that interested in hearing it. I was interested in getting a haircut, but I listened to the problems she was having. Her sister moved in with her because she was going through a divorce. They were having financial struggles. They were having emotional struggles. They didn't know where to turn to for help in their life. 
And I, I listened very patiently, looked at the haircut, it looked okay, got up, paid for it, drove the two and a half hours home. As soon as I walked in the door, my wife said, Tom, looks like you got another $4.99 haircut. <laughs> uh, she could tell I got my haircut. And uh, I said, you know, this lady talked nonstop about all the problems she had in her life. I mean, she just went on and on, this and that. My wife looked straight at me. She said, Tom, did you share Jesus with her? Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't even cross my mind. It didn't cross my mind while I was having my hair cut. It didn't cross my mind the two and a half hours on the drive home. My eyes were closed because I had an agenda in mind, and that was to get a hair cut. And yet God intersected my path with somebody who needed it. That church plant I was just visiting was just a few miles down the road from this lady where she worked. They would have been more than happy to come and introduce her to Jesus and help her with any need she had. But I didn't even think of introducing her to them or to him. I want us to open our eyes a little bit to the harvest right here in your own backyard. Maybe think about some people that we don't think about that are unchurched. Single moms. There was an 8% jump in the number of single moms, single parent homes in Canada between 2006 and 2011. Increased by, it's already high, but increased by 8% and climbing. Poverty is common uh, among single moms. 95% of single moms are unchurched. Which means if they're unchurched, their children are unchurched as well. When you add the two numbers together, it makes the largest unchurched group in North America. Single moms and their kids. <clears throat> You know what? There's not a lot of compassion in most churches about single moms. In fact, the married ladies in the church are afraid of them. Yep. I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. They're afraid of them. Who's going to minister to this group? If Jesus were here, who would he be ministering among? He'd be ministering among people that don't have a tithe base to be able to pay for a pastor. Right? How much money do single moms have? Let's begin to look at the kind of groups of people that we, we need to reach... You're never going to be able to pay a pastor with the tithe income from single moms. And is there a need there? Yep. The harvest is plentiful. These people are receptive. Yes. Their needs are, are immense. And yet we often ignore this ministry. What about college students? How much time, how big of a tithe base are we going to get from college students? Man, they're poor. You offer food and college students show up in droves. Free food, wow. That's tough. They're just barely existing. A ramen. Statistics show 90% of high school graduates who attend church in the 12th grade will are dropped out by the time they graduate from college. Wow, we're losing our young people when they go to college, when they go to university. And we celebrate those that go off to, to CUC, right? But what about those that go to secular universities? What about those that go to public high schools? Do we have a graduation ceremony for them in the church? Do we show, do we honor them with a senior recognition of some sort? What are we doing to retain these kids in the church? What about immigrants? 230,000 new Canadians have immigrated annually during the last decade. Notice where these people are from. They're from, they're, the majority are Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, Buddhist, and Confucian. The mission field has come to Canada. It is here, particularly in our large cities. Are our eyes open to the opportunities that God has placed here? And what, what kind of tithe are we going to get from people who are immigrants? Not much. Not much. Are you starting to see a theme here? The people we're ignoring are those that don't have a financial ability to speak for themselves. So what's the solution? How much do we pay lay people to plant churches? Nothing. Can a lay person plant a church to reach single moms? Can a lay person plant a church to reach refugees? To reach university students? There's a lay church plant right now in St. Louis to reach high school students. Two couples said let's reach the unchurched high school students of our friends, of our, of our children. They're packing their house out. I was showing you read the pictures this morning, wasn't it? It's been a long day. I was showing you those pictures this morning. <laughs> it's exciting. Where are they meeting? In the garage? Basement. It's a basement, unfinished basement. They've turned that into a sanctuary. It's a church, and they packed it out with teenagers. It's not costing the conference anything. Because the conference couldn't afford to pay a pastor to, to pastor teenagers. They have no money. 
It's reasonable that our pastors should be paid a salary, right? Mm -hmm. we, we need our pastors to be able to support, to train, to equip. Yes. I'm all for pastors. Amen. But we need to partner if we're going to finish this work. Mm -hmm. And our pastors need to become mini seminaries to help lay planters mm -hmm. be able to succeed in raising up churches. I met a guy in New York. He uh, works among homeless people, and he's been baptizing several of them and trying to get them to come to the Adventist church that's a few miles away. He said, it kind of works sometimes. I get a few of them to come. Now, what should I do? Well, I think the conference, we should go to the executive committee and see if they'll vote to hire a full-time pastor to go plant a church among the homeless. Is that going to work? I don't think so, but this person's a lay person. I said, what would happen if you planted a church among those individuals? Wow, I could do that. That would be exciting. Amazing opportunities if we open our eyes to what God has for us. Unchurched Harry and Mary. I was attending a seminary at the time this book was published uh, by Lee Strobel, and uh, quite a quite a good book, and it still is. It's still a, it's still published and it's still popular book. But uh, I was working in a grocery store called Meyer. It was one of these superstores, lots of 32 checkout lanes, and I would stock groceries in the evening. And we were given an assignment for a personal evangelism class that we were to connect with an unchurched person. And we were to do that by building a relationship outside of the normal work environment. Just like we did with our vet's son. You know, we see people there in our vet office. It's another thing to have them to our home for a meal, isn't it? Uh, and so it, it's an, a, another step in terms of the relationship connection. So I began to wonder, who am I going to connect with at work? And I... I had a little bit of a trouble because I would go to the non-smoking section during the break and then there was a smoking section and I didn't figure out, figure that God wanted me to take up tobacco in order to reach somebody. So I needed to figure out another way to, to connect with somebody. And so I began to stock groceries on the same aisle as a young man by the name of Harry. And uh, we began working side by side and a friendship was sparked. He was very interested. I've discovered there's a universal human need for friendship. I don't care how rich or poor somebody is. I don't care what ethnicity they are. I don't care how educated or uneducated. Every human being needs a friend. Amen. And Harry responded to my friendship. Amen. So I finally suggested one day, I said, Harry, you know, we should get together outside of work to, uh, sometime and do something together. Harry said, Tom, I've got this place. It's this club. The women, men, they're half naked. You would love it. <laughs> I learned not to make an open-ended suggestion to unchurched un people. <laughs> And so I said, well, how about we go to a diner somewhere near around the corner here and say, oh, Harry, well, that, that's fine. That's great. We'll do that. So we got together, and when Harry introduced me to his wife, my jaw dropped open. He said, Tom, I'd like to introduce you to my wife, Mary. <laughs> Just read this book, Unchurched Harry and Mary. I met them in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Unchurched Harry and Mary. That began a friendship, a spiritual friendship that God blessed and uh, it's amazing to see the openness. And I learned that important principle from Harry, that people are responsive to friendship. I think, Roger, sometimes we have to pay the mailman to do our evangelism for us by sending out these brochures because we've forgotten our God to be friendly with unchurched people. Right. Mm -hmm. If we did our work, we don't have to train grandparents on how to be proud grandparents. We don't have seminars on how to be a gra proud grandparent, do we? No. No, it just happens naturally. But we have to... Train people on how to be passionate about Jesus? Out of the abundance of the heart, our mouth speaks. Mm -hmm. If we're on fire for Jesus, it's going to bubble out of us. We can't hold it back. Maybe there's something wrong with where our passions are at. The problem with the rescue mission is not the harvest. We're told it's truly plentiful. There are thousands of places to be in where the standard of truth has never been raised. How many here in this, in this conference? 493? Is that right, Jeff? Where the standard of truth has never been raised. And there are thousands who might enter the harvest field who are now religiously idle. We're going to give you an opportunity to fill this card out again. There may be some of you that didn't get the card this morning. Or some of you, as you've been attending the seminars, as you've heard me share this evening, that the Holy Spirit's contending with your heart and saying, you need to step into the harvest field. You need to be thrown out of the harvest field. The problem with the rescue mission is us. It's not with the harvest. When we come to the church, there's a problem. When God comes to the church, he finds a lot of Obadiahs. You know who Obadiah is in the church, right? 
Obadiah, I'm too busy. Obadiah, I'm too uncomfortable. Obadiah, I'm too fearful. Obadiah, I'm too apathetic. That's what God finds when he comes to the church. There's a word. And I love this cartoon right here. I asked specifically for this cartoon to be drawn. There's a word there. Do you see it? What's the word? How do you like that word, but? It's not a very nice word, is it? Roger, any of your kids started dating yet? No way. No way. Wait, that one's an old debate. You know, how many of you dated somebody before? You admit, you dated somebody before the spouse that you married. Just raise your hand up. If you dated someone else. Okay, for some of you, this may be the first time you're aware of this information. So I hope you have a good drive home. But anyway, if you dated somebody before your spouse, if, if, if you said the words to somebody, you're a really nice person, but, what did that mean? <laughs> Done, finished, right? Yeah. Even worse if somebody said those words to you, right? Mm -hmm. You're a really nice person, but. That word, but, stands between God's will being accomplished and where the harvest is at, mm -hmm. right there. And what do we see the church doing? We're having a good time fellowshipping, singing our songs, eating our food, right? And over here is the harvest, with that word but in the way. I think it's time to tear down that wall. Amen. Remember when the Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. It is time in the church that we tear down that wall of but. That we tear it down and say, we are going to respond, and we're not going to let those words that come after say the laborers are few. Because there's a solution that Jesus gives us, and Faye Mullins found that solution. Do you know Faye Mullins? Faye Mullins is from a sister conference here. She's from Alberta. I, I was visiting the Alberta conference, and the ministerial director at the time said, Tom, do you want to know about a top soul winner in our conference? I said, absolutely. I'm ready to take notes and give her a call to Texas. Give the, the, that pastor a call to Texas, right? I said, it's not, a, it's not one of our pastors. Uh, in fact, it's a lay person. And in fact, it's a lady. And the more I learned about Faye Mullins, Faye Mullins actually has a stuttering problem. But through being willing to say, yes, I will be a laborer for God, this lady with a stuttering problem has brought over 250 people to God's in the church. Amen. Last year, she planted a church. Amen. And you know how Faye Mullins does it? She goes to the grocery store and she makes friends. And she invites them to a Bible study in her house. And she has food, and she fellowships, and she does Bible study every week in her house. She baptizes those people, she takes five months off, she prays during those five months, builds relationships, and then starts it all over again. And God is blessing her in powerful ways, because she said, I will respond to that call. Faye Mullins taught me that God can equip anyone who's willing to be used. Amen. If he can equip a woman who stutters to go out and win over 250 people to his room at church, what can God do through you if you're willing to be used by Him? It's powerful. Because it's not about us. It's about our willingness, however, mm -hmm. to do what God calls us to do. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest for more rescue workers to enter His harvest. Right now, as Brittany comes up and sings, I'm inviting you to take that card and consider, if you've not filled this out already, these four questions. I'm interested in leading a church plant. We need more laborers. Let's tear down that wall. Let's tear down that word but that stands between us and the harvest. Those excuses, that fear, those reasons that we would hold back from entering God's harvest field. I'm interested in being part of a church plant. It takes a team to plant a church. As a pastor, I'm committed to plant a church in every district I pastor until Jesus comes. And we like more sponsors for those church planters over in Vietnam. Uh, someone was telling me that they signed up to sponsor and they'd like to learn more about their individual to be sponsored. You get a profile, but the face is blurred. Why? They are doing this at the risk of their lives. And we can help them accomplish this. What a privilege. So, Brittany, thank you for singing this as we fill out the response cards.